James, uh, the last couple teams that you've played have gone through a lot of changes over two or three years. What's the difficulty of not only changing a staff for a program, but also then changing philosophies on offense and defense and fitting the players that you have to those strategies? What you're talking, Maryland and Nebraska is what you're talking and, about? And Rutgers to an extent, too. And how many years have those guys been there? Two and then three for Nebraska. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think like always, it takes time. Um, you know, that, that model has changed in today's climate in higher ed and, and specifically uh, major college football. You know, I don't know if it's always realistic. Uh, I don't know if it's always fair, but, but that, that's part of it. You know, um, I think those things got to factor in to what you decide to do. You know, uh, you, know you take over a, a, a physical power eye team and think you're going to be able to transfer to the spread in one year. You know that that's that's going to be challenging to do. So, um, a lot of those things kind of factor into what you decide to do on offense, what you decide to do on defense, who you're hiring, um, how you're recruiting, how you're developing, uh, how you move players around on your current roster. You know, you, every once in a while you move a defense guy to offense or vice versa, but it takes time. Um, you know, I think you know what I see going on at, at Maryland right now. Uh, they're doing a great job. I think Coach has got Coach Durkin's got a lot of energy. Um, you can tell. I, what I'm impressed by is how hard they play. I think that's one of the things that head coaches kind of look for is just how hard the guys play, and they're playing very hard. Um, you know, I've read some stuff that you know they're looking to try to get bigger and, and things like that on the defensive side of the ball. Um, that's always the challenge, you know, in the Big Ten and I think in any major conference across the country is. How do you get fast enough and big enough at the positions you need to to consistently compete uh, week in and week out? And some people are big enough and not fast enough. Some people are fast enough and not big enough. And you need a blend really of both. But um, you know, I see I see a lot of really good things going on at Maryland. It's a place obviously that you know, means a lot to me and has a special place in my heart because I spent a lot of time there. I uh, got a lot of emails and, and text messages and things like that. Um, a lot of people aren't aren't you know with football or with the athletic department anymore, but uh, still know a lot of people in that area, and you know, they're doing a really good job. James, have you thought what it's going to be like walking back into that stadium after spending so much of your football life there? I'm yeah, sure you know security people. Yeah, and... yeah, it didn't, you know, a lot of a lot of high school coaches, a lot of security people. Um, you know, uh, Johnny Holiday. I can I can't believe he's still there. I reach out to Johnny from time to time, and I, especially after I first had left there. Uh, Johnny's there, which is which is awesome. I think Steve Suter, who played for me, is now doing some form of Maryland. Or T Tim Strachan, who I've known forever. Um, you know, Tim's got a great story. He's an awesome person. And then the other guy that I just saw that's back that that you know me and my wife are really good friends with. We used to go to Dave and Buster's. Lamont Jordan. Um, you know, Lamont had a great career there and is a good guy. So there's a there's a bunch of people. Um, you know. Um, the husband of the women's basketball coach, Brenda Fries, um, they're out of town, but they reached out to me. It's just a lot of people. You know, there's boosters. You know, Jordan Steffi, who I think you guys know is a Pennsylvania kid who I've done a lot of stuff with over the years. Um, you know, I, I, I go to his event every single year. There's a bunch of Maryland boosters at that that, that I know. So, um, yeah, it's first time kind of going back in the stadium. I know what the visiting locker room is like, and that's going to that's gonna create some challenges like a lot of the visiting locker rooms in the Big Ten. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be cool. My cousin, you know, coaches in DC, I got aunts that live in DC and in the Maryland area. So, um, it'll be good. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it's going to be about the game. Um, but a lot, for a lot of my staff, I mean, Jamal Griffin was there with me and Kevin Threlkill was there with me. And, um, you know, Jamal was a high school coach in the area. So, you know, there, there's a lot of, that. I don't usually use a whole lot of tickets, but I'm using, I'm using a decent amount of tickets this weekend. How many do you have? Uh, not not like the players. I mean, to be honest, I, I use like four or five a game, um, but but I'm I'm probably use I'm probably using uh, I don't know twenty twenty two. Fumi, my wife's uh, brother, lives in in Northern Virginia in Arlington, so he'll be there. So, hey James, looking at Amani from the beginning of last year until now, where has he made the biggest strides in his game? I think he's just so much more confident now. Amani always had the ability. Um, but he's so much more confident now. He's made some really big plays. Um, I think the other thing is he's found kind of the right weight. At one point, I think he was about 210 pounds. Um, and now I think he's almost all season, he's been two, 202 or under. 
um, which I think is, is plenty big enough to play corner in the Big Ten. And, uh, and um, I think he's just in a really good place to play a lot of football for us. He's very experienced. He's very confident. He's a physical corner. Um, you know, I think, I think the coaches and the team have a lot of confidence in him. Hey, James, you brought this up on Saturday and Tuesday. It's a big picture thing, but I want to follow up on it. About the fourth quarter, and you compared to what you said after the Georgia State game again on your own, how do you balance that of not putting your foot off, taking your foot off the gas? Because you really seem different dichotomy there between Georgia State and this last one. Well, I think the, the hard part is what everybody says, and I get emails and, and direct messages and, and, and stuff from people, well, you, you shouldn't be throwing the ball. You should run the ball and, you know, at the end of the game. You know, um, we don't do that in our offense. We, we, I don't think we have a run play that we just call. And if they're overloaded in the box, that we run it in there. Um, you know, when our defense is on the field, same thing. I don't expect their offense just to stop playing. They got to run their offense to try to be successful. We put our twos on the field. They have a chance to be successful. We're just not going to run dead plays to run them. So it's kind of just an interesting balance of, of, of how do you do it um, in this style of offense. I think if you're at Stanford or you're Michigan State or you're Michigan, different deal. That's, that's kind of your, um, that's your mentality. That's your philosophy. You're going to get lined up in, in sets, 21 personnel, 12 personnel, 22 personnel, and run the ball down people's throats. But you know, when you're running these spread style offenses, it's, it's not like that. So, um, you know, I think that myself and the staff and the fans just need to just kind of understand we're going to be throwing the ball in the fourth quarter with the second group in there. Um, you know, but the reality is we, we just we got to play better. You know, we got to play better. But I think part of it is me getting comfortable with it. Yeah. You know, it's it's different than how I've done it in, in my career. Um, you know, I also, you know, it, I've had the same issue in the past where even running the, uh, the the pro style, the West Coast style offense, you know, you're sitting there trying to run the ball at the end of the game and they got 12 guys in the box or they're blitzing like crazy at the end of the game. You could make the same argument. You don't want us throwing the ball, stop blitzing. You know, um, but that that's the challenge, you know, and, and I'm probably going to talk to some people about how they do it. Um, I see some coaches that, that don't care. They're going to they're gonna try to score 85 points in a game. Um, I haven't really got to that point yet. I care what, what people think um, and, and try to balance what's doing right for, for our football program and also uh, what's right you know, in terms of sportsmanship and all those types of things. But I don't, I don't really know what the answer is in RPO offense. Does that go hand in hand with when you're ahead at the end of the third quarter like a, in Ohio State or Michigan State too? Is that part of the discussion? Uh, yeah. Your overall identity and just being happy with well, it? Well, yeah. No, I, I think there's no doubt about that. That's a, that's a different conversation. Um, but there's no doubt it's, it's, it's a philosophical deal in, in how you're going to approach it. And like I've mentioned before, I think every coach in the country has read the coaching book of what you do in four-minute offense. You've been taught since high school as a player of what you do. But uh, the game has changed, and to try to become something that you're not at the end of the game for, in either situation, whether it's four minute or whether you're up by a bunch of points, you really can't recreate yourself for certain situations. you got to stay true to who you are and stay aggressive and, and, and play. Um, I know for us, um, if, we're, if we're on the other end of a tough loss um, and, and we're getting beat, um, I expect our defense to stop what they're doing. You know, now there's a fine line. You know, you're throwing double passes and halfback passes and things like that. Eh, I think you're, you're pushing it. But if you're just running your traditional offense, it's our job to stop them. Um, that was the way I look at it. James, you've mentioned a few times about people DMing you and stuff. Is there anybody on the staff who says, just don't look at it? Or do you try to convince yourself not to look at what some of the public people are saying after games? Yeah. the the, the Oh, trust me, I, I've, I've major cut down in, in reading emails and, and reading uh, stuff on Twitter and things like that. But the problem is I use Twitter a lot to communicate to recruits. So when it comes through, it's a direct message, and I got 14 of them, and I click through and open it up to see who it is, it's sometimes hard to put 
put you know put the toothpaste back in the in the in the in the bottle at that point or the sand back in the hourglass it's out you know um so you know it it, it is what it is um the emails are good because I, I got somebody that screens those um so i get mostly positive ones there's there's some people that have my email address but but overall um, I, I'm okay with that. I, I really am. Uh, but, there, but there's a fine line of it. Um, and I think, to be honest with you, I need to know a little bit what's going on out there and what's being said. I think you guys remember when I first got here, I tried to read everything because I think it's important that I understand um, you know, what's going on out there. And if there's a narrative that's being told or narrative that's going out there that, that I don't think is correct, I want an opportunity to kind of change the narrative or, or at least be able to kind of tell our perspective on it. But um, you just can't do it all. But I do think a little bit of it is, is okay. You know, I'm, I'm not one of these coaches that sit, sit here and say, I don't read anything because they all do. <laughs> yeah, they all do. You said before uh, perception is someone's reality. Is that kind of why you don't want the perception of you or uh, and then in kind of the respect of that, the program, to have a narrative that you don't think is true out there? Well, I think it's it's just the, it's the whole deal. I want I want the perspective of Penn State football to be one of blue collar, hardworking, class, all those types of things. Um, and and I think sometimes things look contradictory. Um, but you know, once again, there's there's certain things that we are going to do, and I'm I'm going to be comfortable doing them 20 years from now. Um, um, that people may view as not the right thing to do from a sportsmanship standpoint. If, it, it's at, if it's at the end of the game and my twos are in there and they got a chance to stop someone, we are going to do everything we possibly can to stop them. I don't think that's a sportsmanship issue. I think that's teaching your team, whether you're down by 20 or up by 20, you are going to fight and battle and compete. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, and I think you can do that and then also teach your guys that you're going to shake hands at the end of the game. And I don't think those two contradict each other. Some people do. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I really am. Um, I don't think everybody else is. But, but it is important to me how people perceive our players and how people perceive our program and how people perceive me. You know, I, I want to run a hard-nosed, blue-collar, thorough, detailed, um, class program, um, but but you're not always going to make everybody happy. You said you've uh, kind of had to fight the tendency to just accept wins and be crushed by losses. Uh, is that something that say 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 it again? You said that you, you wanted to fight the tendency to just be accepting of wins, correct? And being crushed by losses, correct? Does that extend to the players? Yes, because I see it. I see sometimes we come in the locker room after a win. And they're not celebrating like crazy. I see sometimes after a win, the coaches are not celebrating. They're frustrated by the way the game ended. And I get that. But, but they're too hard. And it's different than basketball. It's different than baseball. I mean, basketball, you, ha you play how many games? 32. Uh, baseball, you play how many games? 160. Yeah, so, so it's different. You can't, like, just, like go crazy all season long. You, you, don't, you don't have it in the tank. But for us, as hard as we work for 12 opportunities, you better enjoy them. And I think that's also what makes you know, the, the regular season in college football so more intense and so more exciting. Um, so, you know, I, I, I want to make sure I've seen it way too many times and I feel it happening to myself. The wins become expected and when you do loss, they crush you. I see that with the fans, I see that with the staff, I see that with the players, and I see that with myself. And, and I, don't, I don't want to live like that. I want, I want to enjoy the wins because we work too hard for them. And I think we all see on any given Saturday, you can get your ass kicked. So, so you, you, better, you better enjoy them and you better not take them for granted because you work too hard to get them. Um, you know, so I, I just, I think, that's, I think that's very common in the industry. But I, I just want to try to fight. I do not want to become, and I'm getting older, I do not want to become the old, crotchety, m miserable coach. And I don't want my staff to be, be the same way.